Without further ado, let me introduce my uh, esteemed panel to you here. On my far right, Frederick Altman, who's Director of Corporate Finance with BMW Group. Uh, Frederick has a global responsibility for BMW Group's capital market activity, including the debt and equity financing. Uh, before returning to BMW's group headquarters in October 2010, Frederick held the position of Chief Financial Officer of BMW Group Australia from 2007, having joined the BMW Group as a specialist in capital markets in November 1998. Um, on my immediate right here, Jacob Brazilius, Group Treasurer of Rickshem AB. Uh, Jacob joined Rickshem in 2012, having spent six years at RBS working initially with real estate structured finance and subsequently with restructurings and workout. On my immediate left, Ian Chisholm is Vice President of Corporate Finance at BHP. He leads the corporate finance team in London and is responsible for developing the company's corporate financial strategy, funding at the corporate and subsidiary level, and relationships with banks, credit rating agencies, and debt investors. Ian joined BHP in June 2016, having worked for Shell for 26 years, and is currently President of the Association of Corporate Treasurers. And on my far left, I have Gerald Dorsch, who is Head of Non-Financial Corporates and Public Finance at the Chinese credit rating agency Dagong Global. Gerald joined Dagong in December 2016 as Head of Non-Financial Corporates and Public Finance. He's a well-respected economist with a wealth of experience in corporate finance, having previously been Head of Credit Rating and a member of the Management Board at Ferry Euro Rating Services AG, and before that at Deutsche Postbank AG, where he was in charge of the portfolio-based regulatory capital risk and liquidity management-driven transactions. So after the introductions, we'll move on to the, the first topic here, um, which is how do you see the ECB handling of the end of QE, a longer taper or an abrupt end, and potential rate hikes beyond that? Unfortunately, these questions were written before the ECB ruined that question last Thursday, um, and we were expecting the announcements to come in July rather than that. So having seen the details that have now come out about the, uh, the tapering of QE, the end by um, the end of 2018, um, and rate hikes now not looking likely until uh, September um, 2019. Frederick, how do you see the, the world playing out in terms of funding uh, as a result of the announcements last week? Yeah, I mean, the first point uh, that comes into my mind is that we will have one player that will lose out a little bit. Um, we have never been very fond of having the ECB in our bonds so far, and uh, we have tried to scale back as much as possible. Uh, well knowing that they certainly bought the papers they needed in the secondary market. Um, I think it's a good thing that we will get back to a situation where secondaries uh, reflect the real uh, environment or the real credit of, of, of a company. Uh, looking into credit spreads, I believe personally that risk is mispriced. And uh, although we don't like it when we see uh, spread widening, I think the market needs a spread widening to get back to a more fair situation. Well, yeah, well, first of all, uh, let me say that ECB has never been a, a buyer of our bonds since we're domiciled in Sweden and outside the euro area. But I guess the, 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 uh, the message we got last week means that the, the quite uh, uh, favorable environment for corporate funding will continue during the autumn. But I mean, I still think there is a very interesting question here because when I look at the ECB governing council, I see a majority who wants a uh, QE forever, or something thereabouts, and you have a minority who doesn't really want QE at all. And so the question is, how will this play out uh, for the rest of this year, and, and what does it mean for next year? Sure. Yeah, I know you've done a lot of funding in the US as well, and you've obviously seen the, the, the two economies recover from QE um, at different speeds. How do you feel the comparison, and, and what, can the, what can the ECB learn from the Fed, perhaps, in the way they went about things? What can the ECB learn from the Fed? Wow. Um, I, I think there's, the Fed at the moment is, is, is steering a, a relatively um, smooth path of rate increases, um, but there is absolutely more risk in the system now. And, and I, think, I think that's right, and, and, and to Frederick's point, it, it's correct that we should go back to what I suppose is normality from you know, before the financial crisis and credit is priced appropriately. Um, but it's undoubtedly true that we will see more volatility in the markets and we'll see more times where markets will not be favorable for borrowers and, and then there'll be good windows which, um, which, which, which will allow borrowers to come to market. Um, 
I do think, the, I mean, obviously we've, we've had the announcement of the ECB last week and that's now what the path that everybody thinks we're on. But I would also say that it's quite likely that that not, isn't the path that we end up on um, and that uh, there will be things that will change the ECB's view and, in, and particularly, I would suggest, uh, around um, risk in, in Italy and Spain and, uh, and other countries, which will just make them change their trajectory over time. And so, so whilst we think we're on this you know, straight path that goes, that we will definitely diverge around that. And Gerald, you know, we've had the emergency measures of QE. Is it time to move away from that emergency measures and um, the timing right? Definitely we expect, let's say, that the emergency measures uh, should stop someday. The question is if it will be the phasing out or if it will be very abrupt. Um, in our rating analysis, let's say, if a rating should be forward-looking, we always have to include, let's say, projections and forecasts of what will, will be, let's say, the funding costs of a company if it can have access, let's say, to investors. And um, if you have one very important investor, if ECB was taking part, let's say, in, in the primary uh, market, um, then let's say definitely the replacement of such an important investor will play a role in our analysis. Because let's say if, for example, uh, bonds cannot be placed at all or not, for example, in total, the question is what will be the use of proceeds then? Will they downsize the use of the proceeds? Will, let's say, there be different um, priorities in using the proceeds from a bond issuance, for example? And let's say this will be factored in, in our rating analysis. So definitely the higher uncertainty about what will happen if ECB steps out will be factored in in our forecast and will have definitely an impact on our rating opinion. Sure. Well, you mentioned uncertainty there. Ian, has that affected your planning for funding for, for 2018? Obviously knowing that this, before last week, was likely to cause some issues in, in the back end of the year. Have you front-loaded things? How has it affected your planning? Or have you looked to go elsewhere and avoid the euro market later in the year? So I've got to answer that in a kind of theoretical way, in as much as right now we're uh, flush with cash. So we're, we're in, in the, the happy point in the cycle where prices are going up, but costs are not yet going up. Um, so there's no requirement for 2018 funding. Um, so therefore, I, I, I can't answer that directly, but, but I would say so if I had had funding to do, I would have been front-loading it this year. Um, and you know, looking towards the second half of this year, I think there's definitely more geopolitical risk and there's more uh, risk with the, with the tapering and, 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 the, and the risk of, of, the, of the Fed getting things wrong as well, of being either behind or ahead of the curve. Um, so uh, it's easy to say with hindsight that that's what I would have done and in a theoretical perspective, but I think that's my perspective there. Yeah, maybe to add on this one, I mean, we are active with 20 to 25 billion euros a year in the markets. Um, our funding planning is, of course, uh, driven by flexibility, and flexibility really means markets, investors, products. And um, I can tell you, yes, we have front-loaded uh, a little bit this year. Having said that, due to our interest rate positioning, we are not willing to front-load too much because carry then certainly becomes a topic that is not viable anymore to, to do so. Um, does it really trigger a big change in behavior? No, it doesn't. We, we just need to cope with it, and then we play the flexibility part. And as you mentioned, uh, volatility will be certainly coming up, um, and it's about timing to, to issue transactions. But I'm personally, I'm pretty positive, at least for us, that we will be able to fund what we need also in the European markets going forward this year. Has there had to be any change in your, your mindset or perhaps what you've got to sell internally, given the change that we've seen in the market from when you issue concessions have gone yeah. one and two and, and where spreads are moving around? As I said earlier, I mean, uh, we always try to squeeze out the ECB as much as, as much as possible, I have to say. I mean, there were maybe others who, who tried to get them in. We tried to get them out. Uh, it's a kind of a game for investors then playing the secondary. But, um, yeah, now we're very conscious towards a new issue premium. Uh, we believe and we may have a more advantage towards our secondary curve than someone who is less active in the market. But of course, new issue premium is, is key for our transaction uh, execution. Having said that, still positive also with this change in the, in, in the market. 
And with, uh, as I say, the ECB don't buy your bonds, but obviously the wider effect on the market, yes. you will see ripple through to yourselves. Yeah. How's your planning been for, for Well, I mean, the situation we have now is that the funding situation is the best it's ever been, basically. And at the same time, the, the funding needs for us are uh, lower than they used to be uh, because the Swedish property market where we are active is very competitive right now, so we can't grow as fast as we used to. So I'm quite easy on the plans and, and quite opportunistic. And so far this year, we have had a strong focus on on bonds in the euro market and the Norwegian market uh, with uh, durations of 10 to 15 years. And if things stay the same, we will do the same in the autumn. But uh, we have, we have uh, lots of uh, financing sources to tap if, if the situation changes. And extending beyond that, as we do in, in question three here, 2019 you expect to be a similar process for yourselves? Obviously planning for 2019 is still somewhat away. Yeah, I mean, we have the ECB who has surprised us a lot in the last, uh, since 2012, basically. Uh, so uh, that's what I said initially. It's very interesting to see how this uh, play out, because if the minority, uh, as I see it, on the council, which includes Germany, uh, wants to uh, kind of uh, put a halt to lots of the unusual activities of the ECB, then uh, the situation will, will change and become a lot more interesting. But uh, I guess the standard bet is that uh, Mario Draghi will continue to rule and, and the situation will be quite favorable also in 19. So, uh, <coughs> yeah, we're quite relaxed. Well, Frederick, 2019 uh, perhaps looks like more, being the more interesting year than 2018. Yeah, now we've got I mean, to be perfectly honest, I mean, the biggest headache for me personally is China. <laughs> we have a very strong growing business in China and uh, to put it that way, our business grows faster than the financial markets matures in, in China, which puts us in a, in, a, in a different position or in a difficult position to secure funding needed. So that uh, keeps me more busy. And the uh, second part is what we noticed when we came in here. It's all this green discussion, what's going on. I think this discussion will continue. We have seen the Euro, European Commission uh, trying to find some regulatory framework around it. Uh, we do support this as, as we don't like the situation as we have it now. But in general, when it comes to the uh, European stability in the market, I'm not concerned. I still see liquidity. As I mentioned earlier, again, uh, uh, when credit spreads widen, you will get the liquidity and you will get your deals done also without having ECB being as active as they are. They still remain with this, what is it, 2.4, 2.8 trillion uh, euros that they will um, reinvest in the market. So they will still be there. And I'm not sure if, um, if there's enough material even to, to satisfy it because we have seen a lot of deleveraging in the corporate market. So I, I'm, I'm not so negative, honestly. Ian, will you have any funding to do in 2019? Perhaps. <laughs> uh, so it depends on commodity prices, but uh, and clearly when we do get back into funding mode, I think it'll be we'll be in looking at diversification. We'll be looking again. We're a dollar funder, so it's about going to all different currencies and seeing what we can get to in an all-in cost basis. So I mean, with the ECB coming into the euro markets, what, what you gain on on the, the spreads and you're, you're losing on the swap. So it, you know, you know yeah. it. For, as a dollar funder, it's not had a huge effect on us, but um, I think there's a, a general perspective and, and question mark over um, whether w the, the capital markets will continue to be as liquid as they have been over the last few years. And I think right now that's what uh, that's our expectation. Uh, it does. They have seem to be extremely resilient through, you know, geopolitical movements and uh, economic movements, and I, and I. I think right now that's our, our base case expectation. Sure. Jared, and Freddie mentioned China there. How do you see, from, from a slightly different perspective, how do you see 29 playing out in the funding markets? Um, let's say we do not expect also on the short, uh, short term that there will be a crisis scenario coming from the Chinese capital markets. So we do not see it. Um, but coming, let's say, to, to your last question, um, when we look the non-financial corporates. One rating factor is, let's say, the, the financial policy that is applied by the corporates. And uh, yes, with a 
growing uncertainty for year end, this year and also for next year. We definitely, we see it from our uh, clients that we cover, but we also would expect that there is a certain portion of pre-funding or let's say front-loaded funding to avoid to fund, let's say, everything that you know already that has to be funded, um, let's say, in the second half of this year. So we do not expect that 100% will be front-loaded so that you can go home uh, and not come back after the summer break. But let's say for having, let's say, a conservative and prudent financial policy, we would expect that there is a reaction of the treasurers of our clients um, to see, let's say, that they react to the situation and they have it in mind. Let's say for everything which is in the funding plan, we would expect this. For everything that is not planned, that is, has to be funded ad hoc, let's say this is the, the tricky question, what other funding sources are available. And so again, it's a question of having a diversified investor base, funding base, having different currencies on hand, having different format of, of placements. So let's say questions that we will discuss here as well. So going to the public market or doing private placements. Let's say these are the questions where we look at, looking at these uh, companies to see if the financial policy is uh, robust and conservative enough to, to cope with these issues. You touched on there the sort of funding mix that we're talking about, obviously with yeah, the size of funding I would like that you've got. To add, I, I agree. I mean, liquidity risk needs to be implemented uh, at a very high level. Uh, this is, comes even before cheap funding, I would say. Mm. Uh, and and the liquidity risk needs to be mitigated or can be mitigated through several measures. Uh, we can take them through. And, and this is especially for China difficult, as when you look into bank funding, you, you normally only get these uh, institutions to, to lend you for one year's uh, maturity, which, which puts the operation somehow in, in liquidity risk and uh, you, it makes it a bit risky towards the regulator as well. But, but one, to, to stick with financing business, I mean, of course, it's diversification. And uh, for the BMW Group, we have since many, many years always focused directly towards the investor. We are not heavy bank funded. So when we talk diversification, a bank is actually not in, uh, in that portfolio of diversification. Um, and uh, maybe you have some experience with your friendly banking partners. They are quicker out than a long-standing relationship with investors. This is uh, our, our strong uh, experience over, over time. And as such, we, we try to, to be prominent in each and single capital markets and where we see potential even also help to develop the capital market. And um, yeah, and, and this is one part of the diversification. Then you go into the investor base, products, maturity profile, and so on and so on. Yeah, could private placement something that, that, that form part of your funding mix? Uh, yes, let me just say, say something about diversification. Uh, in real estate, uh, the most important thing is to avoid uh, the, the banking crisis, which comes from time to time. So. For us, it's very important to diversify away from the local banking system, and that's uh, uh, one uh, strategic driver for us to, to venture out into, for example, the European bond market. Uh, and we only took that step in 2017, uh, and we started out with benchmark transaction. But what has surprised me is the strength of the Euro private placement market, and that has been our preferred and most used uh, source of funding since. Uh, and we're quite uh, excited about that. And you've had a good experience using that market? Yes, very good. It's been, uh, I mean, there's been a few instances where you put in a lot of work and it doesn't materialize, but overall, uh, it's definitely worthwhile. So I'd say it's a market you would recommend to other issuers too? Uh, yes. Yeah. And I know you, know you have a lot of benchmark size funding to do when, when you have your funding to do. Mm -hmm. um, have you looked at the various private places in the market? Do they feature at all in your, your mix, really? They don't really feature at the group level for a company the size of, of BHP. It, it's the, the size that we're looking for is, is more than that. But we do have the occasional joint venture funding requirement. Um, we've got an Australian coal terminal who, which has used both the US private placement market and the 144A market in the US. Uh, and they've, they've seen actually uh, if you tell your story well and you do your investor work, then they've seen it as actually a very useful diversification away from the, the bank market. And of course, there's, you know, we were talking green bonds earlier, but there's, there's definitely 
um, with coal, there's different views amongst the bank group, uh, their enthusiasm for, for coal, um, and therefore going out and diversifying away from the bank market has, has, has proved uh, effective for them. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, for the private placement market for us has been, I would say it's the key tool to position the credit in the European market for us. Um, we rely and, and we have worked, as I mentioned, with the investors we know already uh, heavily on um, reverse inquiry. Uh, we just cover maturity profile up to close to three years, so it's mainly on one and two years bucket where, where we get these um, private placement deals done. And with those deals, we really try and we achieve that to manage the credit spreads on the longer end because uh, I, we, we know we are frequent, but to be as scarce as possible to keep low credit spreads on three years and beyond while having, uh, and then also cater for good transaction bilaterally, agreed on. It's a good price for us. It's a good uh, transaction for the investor because it fits the need. And for us, it's a major tool to really adjust the credit spread in the European market. And Gerald, the guys here talked about the, that credit story that they have to tell to position well in the, in the private place and market. Obviously, that's a ratings agency can play a part in that. Is that something you're seeing more of, particularly perhaps from the, the Chinese issuers looking to, to use the European markets? Um, yes, normally a rating agency is not involved in private placement. So, should change transaction, whatever. So, the majority is taking place without any rating, or at least not a rating of the issuance itself, but the issuer itself. Um, the weaker the issuer, Let's say the more important uh, is, let's say, an independent, maybe third-party opinion. And this is where, let's say, especially a rating agency like ours can play a role because, let's say, we can bring together as an independent third-party opinion provider um, what is the story behind a company if, let's say, a selective group of investors want to look for the first time at an issuer. So what Frederick said, so if you have a very good uh, brand name, if you are a frequent issuer, then a rating agency in the private placement market does not play a role because let's say it's, it's not important. But let's say if it comes to the first time issuance, if it comes to marginal or weaker issuers where it's necessary to get, let's say, a deeper insight in the companies, a rating agency can play that role. And even let's say in our case, if it comes to the translation of the specifics of the European corporate market for Asian or for Chinese investors. Then let's say a rating agency like ours can play a role, but normally let's say the majority of transactions in the private placement market is without. If you look at US private placement type of deals that have, have not only one, two, three years, but have 10 years or more, then let's say having somebody who, who can follow the company, who can follow the credit mm -hmm. story, okay, then a rating agency as well can play a more important role, but for the short uh, data deals, I would say it's definitely not, say, our main focus. Maybe more for other analytical products than the rating product. So if it's only a quick shot like a credit estimation or credit assessment or uh, an analytical service that we provide, which is a scenario-based credit analysis where you say, okay, how would a specific strategic step have an impact on the credit worthiness of either a target, for example, or, or the buyer in an M&A situation? Yes, then uh, again, uh, a rating agency like ours can play a role. But I would say um, for the normal private placement situation, plain vanilla, it's not, it cannot be the main focus, let's say, of a rating agency. Sure, sure. And I think other people as well have mentioned that um in the Schuldschau market in, in recent months, um, there has been a focus on the, should we say, some, some lesser credits going to the Schuldschau market than historically. Is that something as well that, that you guys have latched onto and um, reported on, been required to, to, to offer an opinion on? Um, I think two years ago I made a statement in, in one of these panels and interviews where I said, okay, we see that uh, the weaker clients, the smaller issuers, who cannot go to the mini bond markets or to the to the um, 
uh, SME bond market in several European jurisdictions. They will go to the Schuldschein market, so we will see a worsening of the average credit profile within the Schuldschein market. And definitely this has been the case. It's not so traumatic as we thought it could have happened, uh, but definitely, let's say, in a market where um, the hurdles to use the market coming from documentation, coming from investor work is not so high. Um, it's a certain tendency to, towards, let's say, um, weaker credits who try to use this market if they do not have other alternatives to use. So it's a question of, let's say, um, how these uh, issuers can have access to the normal corporate bond market on, a, on, a, on the public segment or if they have strong and reliable, let's say, banking relationships. And if not, let's say the Schuldschein market is not a closed shop where they say, okay, no, we do not want to have these weaker issuers. The Schuldschein market, as long as there are some investors who would buy this credit also in the Schuldschein format, these weaker credits will use the Schuldschein segment as well. Sure. And uh, we touched on bank relationships there, and, and it must be slightly tougher for you this year not having bond mandates to reward your, uh, your bankers with. There must be a few calls coming in asking, talking about ancillary business. I know the question here talks about regulatory changes, but a lot of you know, corporate treasurer time is taken up um, defending decisions to, to bankers and, and talking about ancillary business. Is that something that is still a regular feature of your uh, your day-to-day -day job? Uh, it is. Uh, so responsibility for bank relationships, it, it does take up quite a bit of my time. Um, in fact, this week and next week, we're having our annual reviews with our 31 banks in our revolving credit facility. Um, we, we take that very seriously. Um, so we put a lot of effort into uh, assessing the bank's performance, each of the 31 over different product types, their interactions, the value that they've added to the business over that time. We, and we give them uh, feedback and scores and then tell them our, our, our focus areas for the next year. Um, so we try to be as transparent as possible on this and we think it actually it, it really repays itself because banks don't go away from that meeting thinking I'm going to get a bond mandate next year because we've just told them you're not. There's no DCM, it's not happening. Um, but of course there is still the uh, eternal bank moaning about ancillary business that I, I don't see that ever going away. Um, but it, I think it's the way around that is to be very clear about what the opportunity set is. Um, but also, there are always, you know, there's always innovation. There's always new ways you can assist corporates. You can come up with different products which might appeal. And trying to just, uh, you know, think through the ideas that you want to bring to the table, I think, is is the right way forward for our bank group. You mentioned yeah. Yeah. Ian's got 31 banks. What's the size? Yeah, now we have uh, 44. I give you a story behind it. <laughs> I mean, we just signed. Oh, just it's last year, July. We signed the 8 billion uh, facility, and before we did that, I mean, we have had the RCF since late 90s. But we did a huge exercise actually last time. We went through more than 300 bank names, and we modelled our business. We took our long-range plan of the business, um, focusing on. Uh, on countries, on regions, globally, and um, we really got a short list of 60 banks where we thought these are names that could fit uh, the BMW group and the business where we will be in for the next five to seven years. Then we um, also modeled, and we had that before, we are modeling a kind of an earnings model that shows what each and respective bank earns through with our business. I mean, we have defined a standard bank with some standard metrics, and in our bilaterals, we then cross-check how far we are off or how far we at least are in that bucket. The, the good thing is, it's not the reality that that's okay. We are pretty close, but it gives us a good indication where each and single bank performs in the sense of how much is it in earning stream, but where does this earning stream comes from? So then we had our BMW wallet, and this is where we came up. So how, how big is the wallet? How big uh, is the needed banking group? And we included six Chinese banks, for example. We came from 38 banks up to 44, and, and we have uh, six Chinese banks. We also decided to put the Brazilian bank in, which is from a rating perspective. You, you would ask, why is that in there? But this is because we have uh, business plans also in Brazil. So 
we take it seriously, we want to deliver on the commitment, but we also make sure we have the right banking partners in the group and not just banks who provide loans. Yeah, I presume you've not got quite as big a banking group as these no, guys, but thanks similar issues at a smaller size? <laughs> no, I mean, we, we bank with the six, seven large Norwe uh, Nordic banks, and I mean, this uh, cross-selling is not a major issue in our market, I would say, so the cheapest and, and biggest lenders to us are maybe the, the bank we do least capital market deals with, so there's not a great deal of correlation there, but... Uh, since joining the Euro market, we have added a couple of London-based banks last year, so I'm on, on 10 or 11 or something at the moment. Okay, good. Uh, Frederick, you mentioned when we were talking about, you mentioned your, your diver diversification earlier, you were saying that actually investors now are perhaps stickier than, th yep. than banks. How have relationships with investors developed in, in recent times, 10 years now since the crisis and, and in recent years? Yeah, I mean, we have always been busy reaching out with roadshows and uh, we rather tend to do it bilaterally than just take a bank that broke us through, through, the, um, through the time. I mean, we do that from time to time as well. And we do actually monitor what's going on in our books. So we have a picture of who's in there when we do our transactions. We monitor with whom we spoke and what they wish. I mean, we are not here to, to just please, but still... You have to give bits and pieces if there are investors who are looking for 10 years uh, maturity, which is completely out of what, what we consider sweet spot of our business. Um, we are still willing to do these 10 years transactions. So we listen to them. We also deliver to their demand. And we make sure that we have a good understanding where we stand in the, in the sense of relationship. And, and, and also internally, we have a long list. We know the people. We, we know whom to call. So it's, it's a work that has developed over a decade, but it pays off. Yeah, a similar, similar requirement, I suppose, to yourself, again, just in a smaller market and yeah. smaller focus in the region. Yeah, I guess we're, we're a newcomer to the European investor uh, region, so we don't at all have long relationships or, or a, a clear picture of who our long-term investors will be. But, <coughs> I mean, we're, we're still looking to develop the European market European bond market uh, further, and uh, we're also looking at uh, at least one new market. So, even though the European bond market is fantastic, it's unfortunately there's one problem, and it's uh, it's denominated in euros. So, and our assets are in Swedish kroners. So we have to swap everything back to Swedish uh, krona, uh, which is a bit of a hassle. It's a fairly liquid market, but. Uh, we have noticed that you have the U.S. private placement market and that would uh, enable us to borrow on similar terms as in the euro market and uh, with long durations, but in Swedish krona. So that is something. Borrow direct in krona. Yeah. Okay. And presumably, similar to, uh, to Frederick, you've got a long list of investors who've, who've invested with you and, and constantly keep them updated. Yes, I mean, we, we uh, do a, a fair degree of, of debt investor work. We've probably toned it down a little bit in the last couple of years, given that the priority has been more about buying back bonds and issuing new bonds. Um, but we still do a, a six monthly debt investor call after our, our half year results and full year results. Uh, we try to tack on to the end of equity road shows, and, and, or if we can integrate them at all, that's quite an efficient way of doing it. We've done um, some kind of speed dating one-on-one -on -one, uh, stuff with, with debt investors um, and I would suggest that we'll, we will ratchet that up over time as, as, as we see the funding requirements come coming back um, but I, I think the, I think the debt investors are the, the ones that we see certainly that they are very well engaged and, uh, and understand the credit they've got good questions so we're, you know we're happy with that process at the moment and Joe, would you see how, how's your interaction with investors at the moment? How, how do you feel they're, they're seeing the corporate world and, and how does your relationship with, with investors? So normally, we, as a rating agency, we are not, let's say, in the direct situation where a corporate is together with his uh, investor base. So normally, we are not. We are not bankers. Um, but let's say the a simple question that we can ask um, if we are in a, in a management meeting with senior management of a corporate is asking the simple question, 
do you really have uh, only transaction specific uh, investor relations work or do you have a more sustainable approach and seeing your key investors throughout the year and let's say we can compare the normal corporate presentation we see the updated investor presentations we see the differences um, what is the focus of investor presentations if they are streamlined if they are focused to the specific information need of individual investors or if they more general for every investor really the same which should be normally but let's say if if issuers are very keen to work with specific investors let's say we see that there is some information flow and some uh, very specific uh, work with investors where we can see okay the issuers are working closely with investors it's not only handing over the pure figures and letting him do the the credit work no it's a real work with investors so that the investors understand the credit story behind and this is really a work and let's say we definitely um, prefer or let's say uh, give credits to an ongoing steady maybe non-transaction specific investor work because this is let's say what helps so you do not have to be a frequent issuer so even if you go to the capital markets once a year every two years with some kind of public transaction um, your name should be in the mind of your main investors and therefore let's say the analysis of the order book to see who invested in which type of format and after or let's say uh, a specific investor event let's say this is let's say definitely what we what we analyze and let's say where we uh, ask our questions to understand how robust and how sustainable is the investor work done by the corporate thank you so um we're moving on to our last question so a bit like the england football team last night we're going to see what positives we can take at the end so ian what positives can corporate treasurers take looking forward in funding for the next 12 months what do you see out there that's that's positive and uh, and will keep you from sleepless nights well i think uh, i mentioned earlier i think the uh, credit markets have been remarkably robust in the, in the last couple of years uh, but to a certain extent that has been as a result of volatility being dampened down by central bank behavior right so um the you know the the punch ball is being taken away from the party um, so I do think that there will be more volatility, but I still think that there's the, the, the credit markets are, there's a lot of demand still out there for the product. Um, and I would just suggest that we'll see still some good windows that you can go to market. We'll just see some windows where you can't and you'll need to be as a treasurer more flexible with plan B and you know, make sure that you've got alternatives and just a, a little bit more nimble and dynamic in the markets too. Yeah, could similar approach to yourself? Well, I mean, e either the, the fair belt conditions will continue, uh, but they, <coughs> sorry, they might not. And uh, I guess the positive then would be for the corporate treasurer that life will be more interesting and uh, mm -hmm. he will provide or she will provide more value add to the, to the corporate. So, uh, but I mean, it's difficult to see how things could be even better than it's been 2016 or 17. So. Hoping more of the same. Yep. Frederick, yourself? Yeah, I mean, liquidity should be around. I'm positive on that one. We will see maybe some emerging markets developing more towards what we know as a standard. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, China, uh, Korea, these are uh, countries where I believe we will see some positive movements and possibilities for us. Um, again, I hope we will have a skew towards uh, fair pricing of risk, which means for treasurers maybe that credit spreads will increase, but this is where it should be. So that's a kind of normalization when, when ECB is gone. Um, I, I'm not doomy or gloomy towards the future at all. Uh, I think it's good, it's about relationship. I have not experienced any, any concern so far. We would just be prudent with the timing and, and we saw that clippings and we never talked about it here on the screen. Timing can be a bit uh, unlucky for, for people sometimes. It was unlucky for those guys. But in some yeah. senses, it's a, a, refl a reflection of an improvement in the economy and getting back to where we think Normal. uh, normalization. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, the US economy is in very good shape, and, and I guess the, the deflationary uh, concerns have gone away. It's now potentially inflationary concerns. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that, that 
you know, as, as Frederick says, it's not just all doom and gloom that the ECB goes away. That's actually a good sign that the economy is in, in better shape. Sure. Gerald, a final word from you on the positives for the next 12 months? Um, positive, I do not know. Um, you said uh, normalization. I would say we all would wish that we go back to normal, but we do not know if there is a normal in the future. So I would say it would definitely be better if all market participants would show the flexibility, would be able to adjust, let's say, their financial behavior, their financial policy, their business profile to the situation that we will have. Maybe it's not the financial side which brings uh, the additional risk coming, uh, uh, let's say, in the future. Maybe it's the geopolitical risk. We do not know what is happening with, with Russia, with Italy, with Turkey, with a lot of different, let's say, scenarios we have in the world. Um, and, and maybe, let's say, uh, the companies, if they are not thinking back to normal and we come in a, into a calm environment, this would be better than thinking, okay, we are coming to a situation where everything can be forecasted and foreseen. I think the flexibility is key, and this we would uh, expect also from our clients. Thank you. Well, that's the conclusion of this panel. Thank you for, for sticking with us through that. Um, thank you to my guests for their time today.